Harold Eugene Mullahan, JR to those who knew him best, was a 62-year-old from Norfolk, Virginia. He was a firefighter and previously a pro-level surfer. On August 3, 2015, JR dropped his wife off for work and returned home. However, when she got home later that day, he was gone. JR's truck was found on the beach in Corolla, North Carolina two days later. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Densel, and this is Unfound. grandfather. His name was Grandpa Chook, C-H-O-O-K. It was a nickname. His real name was Clyde. He died in 1987. He was my father's father. Well, besides his love of golf, the other constant in his life was his diary. He documented everything that went on from day to day. It also included the weather, temperature, and anything noteworthy at the national level. To this day, I can see the book sitting on a coffee table at his house. And now that I'm talking about it, I bet my dad has those diaries somewhere. Several times I've personally tried to keep a diary or journal in my life, but I've never gotten too far. Maybe I'm just not that nostalgic or introspective enough to put feelings and thoughts to paper on a daily basis. I bring this up. Because on today's episode, you're going to hear from a wife who started writing about her husband's disappearance as soon as it happened, her thoughts and feelings, who she talked to, and what she thought happened. Reading her recollections was like a time machine, taking me back to August of 2015 in Norfolk, Virginia. She allowed me to read her Diary of a Disappearance. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Goodsight, charlieproject.org. In the months leading up to JR's disappearance, he had battled and beaten depression along with a Percocet addiction. He had come out the other side with a new lust for life, even singing and whistling around the house. In addition, he took new pride in his man cave on the second floor of the home he shared with his wife Julie, where he displayed, among other things, a surfboard from back in the day when he contemplated going pro. Instead, he chose to become a fireman. On August 3rd, 2015, JR dropped his wife off for work. This wasn't unusual since she had just recovered from surgery and wasn't able to drive. She believed he would return home to pick her up later that day. However, Julie came home early due to a migraine headache. She found the house empty and JR's truck gone. After searching, she discovered the surfboard he displayed to be missing. His cell phone was left on top of the printer next to his desk. Right away, she knew something was wrong. Two days later, police in Corolla, North Carolina, almost two hours away, found J.R.'s truck on the beach. The belief is that it was there since the day he disappeared. The surfboard was in the bed. Inside were J.R.'s shoes, wallet, and other items. J.R. was never seen again. The investigation has been complicated by the following factors. Law enforcement's belief that J.R. went for a swim and drowned, despite the fact that almost all drowning victims are recovered in that area. A complex relationship with his daughter that had gotten nasty in the months leading up to J.R.'s disappearance. And the ending of J.R.'s Percocet addiction that might have caused his black market dealer to seek revenge. J.R.'s wife believes foul play was involved. The interview for this episode is with JR's wife, Julie Mullahan. Unfound News. This past week was a sad one for Unfound. Many of you probably already know that at least part of the mystery regarding the disappearances of Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman has been solved. A career criminal, Ronnie Dean Busick, has been charged with their disappearance and murder. It is believed that he and two other men who are now deceased Phil Welch and Dave Pennington first murdered the Freemans, burned down their home, then took the two teenagers with them. 
Police believe these three men then raped and tortured Laura and Ashley for several days before strangling them to death. Moreover, they took pictures of the girls and showed them to others, meaning many other people besides these three knew what they did but said nothing for all these years. My deepest sympathies go out to the Bible and Freeman families, especially Loreen Bible, who was on Unfound in October of 2017. But the mystery is not quite solved yet. Laura and Ashley still need to be brought home. Next, the Tribune Review in Pittsburgh has another missing persons article coming out this Sunday. The disappearance of Kathleen Kelly. She vanished from Springdale, Pennsylvania on May 22, 1981. Kathy walked from a roller rink to her sister's. From there, she was headed home. She never made it. There has been virtually zero media attention given to this case over the years. But now Trib Total Media will be covering it in depth. Please check out the article at TribLive.com on April 29th. And please stay tuned in at the end of this episode as I interview Stephen Huba from the Tribune Review about Kathleen's disappearance. Finally, Volume 3 is done. It's off to the printers. Please look for it on Amazon in both ebook and print form very soon. It took a little longer than I predicted, but it's done now. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Podomatic, Stitcher, Podbean, and Spotify. In particular, please join us on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern for the Unfound Facebook live video show, which is hosted on the Unfound podcast page not in the private group. You can email the program unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. The website unfoundpodcast.com. Please check out the secret Stephen Kocher episode. The website at Trib Total Media, triblive.com forward slash news forward slash unfound. Unfound has Patreon and PayPal accounts. Your contributions provide for many of the items guests have received so far. I cannot thank all of Unfound supporters enough. Our most recent contributors are Amy and Barbara. Unfound Merchandise, Volume 1 and 2 and 3 on Amazon in both paperback and ebook form. Let's try to work on getting some great reviews for Volume 2. If you've bought it, please give it a nice review. The Playing Cards, go to makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. Shirts for almost all Unfound's cases at unfound-podcast.myshopify.com. This includes the flagship t-shirt, The First Year Cases, that has a collage of everyone from Suzanne Lyle to Jennifer Wilkerson in it. Please check it out. And please mention Unfound on all True Crime Facebook pages and other websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so fortunate to have on this episode of Unfound the wife of Harold Eugene J.R. Mullahan, Julie Ann Kelly. Julie? Welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Let's start here, and I'm sure the listeners are going to wonder a little bit about this. How does a guy whose name is Harold Eugene go about getting the nickname J.R.? His name actually is Harold Eugene Mollahan Jr. So he goes, he in his childhood, he just picked up the name J.R. They used to call him Junior, but when he got older, he went by J.R. Oh, that explains it. So I guess his father's name was exactly uh, Harold Eugene as well. Yes. Okay, great. So tell the listeners uh, a little bit about J.R. Um, First of all, uh, how did you two meet? Um, I know that you had been married since 2010. How did you two meet? And tell the listeners a little bit about him. Well, actually, I had just returned from Pennsylvania visiting my grandchildren, and my dog ran out of dog food, and I went to the family dollar, and I actually met him in the family dollar. I was walking down the aisle, and he looked at me and said, ooh, you have beautiful eyes. And I said, flattery will get you nowhere. Next thing you know, we were having dinner. Is that right? You met in the family dollar. That's, uh, That's very interesting. It's like it was meant to be or something. Right. Wow. And how long uh, after that, uh, how long did you, I guess, date uh, before you two got married? We dated 
um, three years. All right, so a little while. Okay. What did you learn about him? I mean, what did, after he told you you had beautiful eyes, what did you learn about him over those few years that finally made you decide, yes, if he proposes to me, you were going to say uh, yes? Well, I think it was this, when we went out to dinner, when we were um, enjoying our meal, and he was just glowing whenever he would talk about his grandson. And I don't know, there was just something looking into his eyes. Um, every day I just knew he was, he was the one. He was a firefighter and he, I don't know, he was just an all around great guy. He was not fake. Everything about him was genuine. So you say he was a, a, a firefighter. Was that, uh, I guess that wasn't a volunteer position. He was a paid firefighter. That was his job. Right. Professional firefighter. Professional firefighter. Okay. So he ran into buildings save people, put out fires, uh, kind of uh, have to have some bravery to have a job like that. Uh, but he was also, he had a motorcycle. Was he into motorcycles as well? Um, not until after we were married. He mm. bought one, and he found out that he loved riding them. Previously, as a firefighter, he always called motorcycle riders brain donors. Yeah, it's dangerous. It's well, dangerous. Well, especially because... So many people ride without a helmet, and as a firefighter, he said too many times he had had to clean up brains off the street. Oh, my. Oh, my. And while you were dating him, um, I guess he had been married before because we're going to talk. He has a, a couple da daughters, but uh, how many times had he been married before, and did those daughters or ex-wives, was he still friends with them? Did he stay in contact with them? He was still in contact with him. He was married three times prior. He had a daughter by his um, first marriage, a daughter by his second marriage, and he did not have children with his third wife. And so uh, you uh, got married to him, and if I may ask, have you ever been married before, and do you have any kids? Um, I was. I have three children, and I was married three times prior myself. All right, so it all worked out, I guess, then. Yep. You, you two had uh, that in common, and you had children from previous marriages. Okay, so maybe it was just meant to be that you met in that family dollar. It was. It was It was just unbelievable. I'm sure that had to be a little uh, surprising when you revealed some of your past, and it turned out you'd been married the same amount of times. Right? Correct. Okay. Now, something that's uh, going to come up uh, in this uh, case is he was into surfing as well. What did you learn about that uh, from him, is that something he was doing uh, when you two met, or is that something he had given up by that time? He had given it up. Um, in his younger days, he was a basically a professional surfer, if you will. He had actually been offered a contract with wave riding vehicles to become a professional surfer and spokesperson or whatever you do for them. Mm-hmm. But he decided to join the fire department instead. And, he, I mean, he loved surfing. He was an avid surfer his whole teenage years and, and younger adult years. But as he said, when I had met him, he said it was a sport for a younger man. Yeah, probably as a kid. Uh, it can be a little dangerous. And, yeah, it's very physically taxing. And, uh, you know, at the point time that he disappeared... He was, what, 60-some um, years old, Two. 62 years old. So I don't know how many 60-some-year-old surfers there are out there. Did did he live somewhere where waves were common? Did he live in California or Hawaii, or, or how did he get into it? Well, he lived, he lived in Virginia, but he would travel to the Outer Banks of North Carolina where there were decent waves. Um, and Avon, Corolla, and different... Um, beaches out there is where he would go to surf. And but did you uh, while you were two together, uh, did you ever actually see him attempt to go out and try to surf again just to show off for you or anything when you went down there? Oh no, no. no. Like I said, he said surfing is a younger man's sport, and he actually had his surfboard just kind of stored away. And then when we moved into our home that we lived in, where he went missing from. Mm -hmm. 
we had put his surfboard together. I had talked him into hanging it on his wall, and he thought it was a great idea, so he had hung it on his wall, kind of like a trophy, like like you would put your old ba- uh, baseball or basketball trophy on a shelf. Yeah, that's that was a great idea, Julie. I'm sure he appreciated uh, your input on that. Well, he did. Yeah, and I mean, it's a great conversation. You have people over. Maybe you go into where this surfboard is. It's a great conversation piece. Oh yeah, I used to surf. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he had it hanging up in his room that we call, you know, we called his room his man cave. Yep, those are those are common these days. Um, all right, so you two were married for how long before he disappeared? We got married July twelfth of twenty thirteen, so two years and one month. Now, there were some other things uh, going on in his life, and the only reason we talk about uh, these issues is because some of these issues, with my experience, and as the listeners know who have been with the program since the beginning, some of these issues uh, can lead to disappearances and and problems in people's lives. That's the only reason that we're going to talk about them. Um, First of all, he was suffering from some depression, uh, any reason where that where that came from, why he might have been uh, having those feelings? From what he had told me, he had been suffering from depression for many years. He had been on Zoloft when I first met him, but he said it wasn't working. Um, and then, you know, through some different events that went on, we did finally go to a doctor and seek medical attention to get the proper medication. That was prior to him going missing after some other things that went, that took place. Hmm. Do you believe there was anything in particular that brought this depression on, or is it like many millions of people who just have maybe a little bit of a chemical imbalance, something like that? What do you think? I think it was a combination of both in that, I mean, he had a rough childhood, I won't go into great detail for um, you don't have to his family. You don't have but, to. I mean, he had some, as we've all had some rough childhoods. His was a little rougher than most. But between that and then some chemical imbalance, I think um, he suffered with as well. Now, something else, and this is another has been another well-known topic on Unfound is he might have developed uh, a, an opiate addiction. Uh, with not through illegal drugs, but through legal drugs, uh, and in fact, one of those drugs being Percocet, and I know about that drug because my father uh, is taking that. He just had an operation, so I know a little bit about that drug now. But um, can you tell the listeners a little bit about that regarding Jr.? Well, he had gone through um, a, a deep bout of depression, I would say. 2013, 2014, and a friend of his had given him some Percocet for some pain. He was having some back pain, and after he took it, he realized not only did it take care of his back pain, but it took care of what he calls his mental pain, and he said, I don't think I've ever taken a medication that really took care of both, so... He became addicted to it in that, you know, he thought, wow, this is the medication I need for my depression. So he was just kind of like medicating himself. But at some point, he saw that that was a problem, and he went and got treatment, didn't he? He did. He actually came to me one evening and asked if we could talk. We sat down on the couch, and he wanted to be up front with me and told me that he had been taking the Percocet you know, for his back pain and that, as I said, that it was helping his mental pain. He said, but now I've become addicted and I don't want to be addicted. I just want to be happy. So he was being so sweet and genuine and upfront. And I just told him, babe, we can take care of this together. I'll go to the doctor with you. And and we did. He sought um, medical treatment. He sought counseling and we went together. And how long would you say that was before he disappeared? Um, and it was ongoing for about nine months. Okay, so he, how? I guess maybe I should ask you it this way. When he came to you and said that he thought he might have an addiction, how f- long was that? Was it nine months before he disappeared or longer than that? Yes. 
about nine months. About nine months before he disappeared. Okay. So when how did you think that when he came to you and said that, uh, were you maybe personally aware that something was going on, or was that a surprise to you? I had an inkling. I didn't know for sure, but I had an inkling. And when he came to me, I just let him know that I had a suspicion, but that, you know, we could work through it together, that it doesn't change how I feel. Because mm-hmm. he was afraid I was going to, like, love him less or be disappointed in him. And, yeah. and, and I told him, absolutely not. Right. The fact that you were, you know, being up front and wanting to get help actually made me admire you more. So that just made it easier for him. Good. And you thought that the, the treatment that he was going through uh, was going well? In your opinion? Oh, it was. It was. And he would tell me all the time how good he felt. And he what? he'd be walking around whistling and singing. And he was just, he was so happy that he was happy. Happy to be happy. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. Because uh, as you know, I mean, you don't have to be a missing persons expert or anything else. You know that there is a huge problem with opiates in the in the United States, just not the United States, but in our country in particular. Um, with no, I do. Addiction. As a nurse, I know even more so because right. I see it all the time. Right. Of course you do. Of course. Um, now, one more thing, and uh, she will pop up a little later, but Jr. was also having some issues. And you said he had two daughters, but uh, right. his younger daughter, Kelly, we're not going to use her last name, um, he was having some issues with her. We don't want to go too deep into this, but... Maybe just give the listeners a general idea of maybe the uh, problems that he, Jr. and he, he was having with his daughter. Well, when I first met him, he was, you know, going into detail, telling me about his grandson. Like I said, he would, you know, just light up talking about him. But I, he also divulged that he was just recently allowed to see him again. It's as if his daughter just kind of used her son, his grandson, like a pawn, just like some divorced parents do. To to get money, to get things like that, or what? Um, kind of in a roundabout way, in a very mani- ma- excuse me, manipulative way. Yes, she was very manipulating with her child. Okay. And uh, just to be honest, do you think that she had a problem with you too? Oh, yeah, she did. She was very jealous. It manifested in so many different ways. Okay. And would you say that uh, from the first time you met him at the the family dollar, that 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 was something that was uh, evident? Or do you think that it got, uh, maybe got worse as time went on? Or from like the first time that maybe she found out that her dad had a new woman in his life, she was like that? Actually, oddly enough, the first Christmas, so we met in October, and by December, our first Christmas of 2010, she actually gave me a beautiful Christmas card telling me how thankful she was that I was in her dad's life, and that was short-lived because within a matter of, I'd say, months after Christmas, we were back to um, square one with her being very manipulative with her son and not wanting him to see her son. So it was almost like when she couldn't get her way, then, you know, you can't see my son. That happens. And did, uh, would this have been a situation where uh, you and Jr. lived close to Kelly? I mean, if, if if everything was fine, would Jr. have gotten to see his son a lot, given the distance between them, or, or what? Oh, yeah. We lived probably eight minutes tops from each other. Okay. In our first house, we did move later, but we still went 15 minutes away in the second house. Right, and every, of course, every grandparent would love to live that close to their grandson or granddaughter, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. Especially you'd think that some parents, they don't mind shipping off the kids to the grandparents once in a while, right? To have a little right. free time, right? Exactly. So, okay. As now, um, we're going to get into what happened that day, but just... All these years later, uh, not quite three years, two years and some months, eight months maybe. Um, Now, do you look back at anything that was going on before he disappeared 
and say maybe that wasn't right, there was something wrong, anything that you've had a chance to think about. And I know that listeners should know from the time that he disappeared, you kind of have kept a journal. I know you go back and read those things. Anything now that your opinion has changed on since that time as to what was going on before he disappeared? Not really. It's all it's it's all just such a mystery. I mean, there were so many things. I know in one journal entry I had written, I was just, you know, asking him, you know, were you sick? You were did you have something, a disease or an illness that I was not aware of, like maybe a terminal illness or, you know, did you have a heart attack? It was just, you know, speaking into thin air in my journal, if you will. Mm-hmm. You know, were there things that I didn't know about with your health? And he did have pre-diabetes, so I wondered if maybe that day he had a low blood sugar. I mean, there were just so many questions. Or some of the questions in my mind were, you know, has somebody done something to you? Mm-hmm. Because it just didn't make sense, and especially after when they didn't, you know, find him and we had not recovered a body, I can't help now but really wonder if there was not some kind of um, foul mm-hmm. play. Okay. And we're and we're going to talk about that that for sure. Uh, before he disappeared, did he ever say anything to, to you like he got he was threatened in any way, or maybe just had some run in with somebody in a parking lot? Like any anything, what I would call stupid, yeah. something like that. You know, any yeah. calls like people calling him and hanging up. Do you remember anything like that? Nothing. Nothing. In fact, the day that he disappeared, I mean, everything was normal as whatever normal is, but. It was just like any other day, August 3rd. Exactly. I still have the grocery store, our local Farm Fresh grocery store ad with the receipt. He had purchased some groceries the day before and had planned a special meal for, you know, Monday. So we get to that day, August 3rd, 2015. What do you remember about that day? And maybe we, we should start here. He drove you to work that morning, but there was some. Um, Something weird that he actually tried to get you to drive him, drive yourself to work. What do you remember about all of that? Well, I was dressed and ready to go to work because he was going to be taking me to work. I had been having some issues with my car and I had had foot surgery with my right foot and I was ready to go. And I said, babe, I'm ready. And he came downstairs. He's like, Jules, how about you just take the truck today. And I'm like, well, don't you have a doctor's appointment? He's like, oh, you're right. But he did, oh, before he did say he had some other things he had to take care of, like on the phone, which was um, with our credit union and with our uh, vehicle insurance, things that he wanted to take care of that morning. So he didn't even want to take me to work. He wanted me to take the truck. Mm -hmm. But again, I reminded him of his appointment. So he's like, oh, you're right. So he said, give me about three minutes and I'll be ready. And what time was that uh, the, the appointment uh, supposed to be that day? 10 a.m. The doctor's appointment was supposed to be 10 a.m.? Correct. Okay. And so he ends up taking you to work. What time do you usually leave for work and what time did you get to work? I could not tell you what exact time we left, but I can mm-hmm. tell you the exact time he dropped me off. Because I just happened to glance at the clock as I was getting out of the truck, but um, he had jokingly said, you know, as he was dropping me off, well, first I had said, you know, pretty soon this will be a distant memory having to bring me back and forth to work because I was getting my vehicle worked on in the following month or weeks. I don't even remember that part. But he's like, oh, just get over here and give me a big kiss. And then I gave him a kiss. And as I was backing out of the truck, out of the um, passenger side, as I said, I noticed the clock. It was 8.27. He's right. And then he said, all right, now get in there and make us some money. You know, because he always said that to me. Uh-huh. He was very funny. All right. That was the kind of um, relationship you two had. Kind of uh, right. some humor in it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how often would you say, I mean, I know that you said you had this foot issue, had your car issue. Would you say that it was common for him to drive you to work or when, during these times or not? At this point, yes. Um, he would take me to work and then pick me up. And what time uh, would you have expected him to pick you up that day? 
about 5 p.m. would be the norm, but I normally would call him because sometimes I work over. I'm a workaholic. So he drops you off at 8.27 a.m. Uh, were you under the impression that he was going to just drive right to his appointment? I know that it would still be an hour and a half from now. Or do you think, did you think that he was like going to go home, maybe get a shower, change clothes? What, what did you think was going to happen? That's exactly what I thought. He'd go home, get a shower, because we only lived like 10 minutes from the doctor's office. So he would have gone home, gotten a shower, and then gone off to his appointment. Okay. And was this uh, an appointment that uh, he had like every month, or was this just uh, some sort of checkup? I don't want to get too deep. We've already talked about uh, some of the issues that that he was having. I don't want to get too deep into his personal life or anything, but... Uh, was this an appointment that had been scheduled for a while, or, or what? Do you it know? was actually a, his weekly therapy appointment. So he would. Uh, this was a weekly thing. So the week before he disappeared, he would he went there as well. Correct. All right. And uh, how did uh, any idea how those sessions were going? They were going great. He shared it all with me, and actually, he kind of, as as he was and did took a couple people under his wing. He was in therapy, and he was trying to help some of the people he was in therapy with. It was a group therapy. Oh, it was, oh, it was group. It wasn't one-on-one with a, a therapist or doctor or counselor. It was... Well, he had his one-on-one, but this was his weekly group therapy. Weekly group. And then you also said that he maybe had a couple other business things to take care of over the phone. Uh, do you think that he could have taken care of those things before he went to this session, or do you think he was going to wait till later um he he could have done them before it was just really basically a phone call that would have taken a few minutes so he drops you off at 8 27 you think that he'll be back uh later in the day but um some things go on with you uh at work why don't you uh relay to the listeners uh what happened once you got to work well i mean everything at work was status quo that day until around noon, I developed a migraine. I had a history of migraines and it was a horrible migraine and I had taken something for it and it didn't work, but it was kind of migraine that I had to go home and lie down. So um, one of my coworkers took me home. It was a little after two. She drove me home. And as we were coming around the corner, I'm like, oh, JR's truck isn't even here, which was not alarming to me because, mm-hmm. you know, he's a grown man. He can go wherever he wants. Sure. So I went inside, um, took some more ibuprofen, and proceeded to lie down on the couch. And I thought, oh, let me call JR. If I fall asleep and he goes to pick me up from work, that would be rude. I mean, those were my thoughts. So um, I texted him. I didn't call him, actually. I texted him to say, hey, babe, um, I came home early with a migraine. Just wanted to let you know. And then I proceeded to lie down again. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get a response you know, after about five, 10 minutes. And I thought, well, that's weird. Let me make sure I sent it correctly. So I sent another one, checked the first one. It did go through. So I sent another one and still no response. And when I didn't get a response from the second one, I was like, well, that's weird. I mean, it just felt even weirder. So I called him. And then when he didn't answer, then I don't know why, but I just got this terrible feeling come over my body like, something wasn't right because he would always respond to a text or a phone call. And at this point it had been 30 minutes since the first text. So I thought, okay, something's wrong. And you had told me that throughout your relationship, you two were fairly communicative. I think that's the word. Oh yeah. Communicated a lot. When he would text you, you'd get right back to him and you texted him and get right back to you. Um, Correct. And even more so, for him, because I'm a diabetic, so, you know, he was always in constant contact with me. He sometimes would even call me at work and ask me if my blood sugar was low. He would know before I would. Being that you left work early, uh, did it ever occur to you that to call him to come pick you up? If this is, like you said, you had a history of migraines. Um, if you'd ever left work early before, maybe you didn't have your car or something, did he ever come pick you up? Or was it standard for uh, somebody to take you home? Well, no, I would I would have called him, and I had planned on calling him, but one of my coworkers, who was just getting to work for shift change, said, "I'll just take you home." So she took me home. 
As you've already said, you tried to text him. He didn't get back to you. Tried to call him. Do you remember if it rang or did it go straight to voicemail when you called him? It rang. It rang. And, and then it went to voicemail. Okay. So did you end up lying down and just thinking, well, he'll probably be home soon? Or did you start looking around the house? What happened next? Actually, um, I started looking around the house because, like I said, something just came over me like something's wrong. So I went upstairs, which was where his man cave was. The whole upstairs was his. And I just kind of started looking around to see if there was anything. I don't know really what I was looking for, but I just kind of started looking around and as I'm turning around the room slowly, and I'm calling him the whole time. I mean, I started calling him incessantly at this point. But I started calling again. I hung up and called again, and I thought I heard his phone ring. And I'm like, what the heck? So I hung up, because, you know, it would only ring a certain amount of rings. So I hung up and started ringing again. And then I could hear it. I'm like, oh, my God, what in the world? So I'm looking everywhere for this ringing. And I looked in the attic because I kept hearing the ring. And no, there's no ringing in the attic. And then all of a sudden I turn around and I see his phone on top of the printer upside down. Flip it over and the volume is on really super low. But at first, before I found the phone, I thought, oh, my God, did somebody come in here and kill him and stuff him in the attic? Because I kept hearing the ring. Yeah. And as soon as I found the phone, I don't know what, what you know made me turn around, but I turn around. And I noticed that the surfboard is gone. I'm like, what in the world? And it wasn't just hanging up there. He had it wired. So he had to unwire it to get it down if he if he's the one that did it. And then I looked over at his bed and I saw this trail of dust, which would have been where the surfboard, which was in its, uh, its case or cover, if you will, must have been um, laid across the bed. Mm-hmm. After he got it down. Moved from the room, yeah. After he got it down, uh, to, as far as your memory goes, how how many maybe years uh, had that surfboard uh, been hanging up in his man cave? Well, we moved in there in 2012, so three years. Like I said, it was wired to the hooks yeah. on the wall. And had you seen him, or had anybody else? I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe somebody comes in there to do some remodeling or, or whatever. That surfboard was up there the whole time, had never been taken down before? Never. And the phone, when you say it was upside down, you mean the screen was facing down? Correct. So you pick up the phone, and it, where was the phone exactly sitting again? Um, it was on the printer, which was adjacent to his desk. When you come up the stairs, as soon as you turn left, it's a big open space. As soon as you turn left which would be kind of like his little office area with his desk, and to the left of the desk is where the printer was sitting. Okay. Had you ever known him to set his cell phone on there before? I know that, you know, in my little place I have here, I live by myself. There's only a couple places in my place that my phone is ever going to be found if I'm here. What about with JR on uh, where he would put his phone? Normally it would be on the um side table next to his recliner. I had never known him to put it on the printer. Not that that would be weird, but at this point, from this point on, everything was weird to me. Like, why did, why is your phone here? And, you know, I'm thinking out loud or I don't even know if I was actually verbalizing out loud at this point. I'm just have these millions of questions going through my head. Like, why is your phone here? Where's your surfboard? Where are you? What in the world? Yeah. So, of course, immediately, yeah. you know, I start, I wouldn't say freaking out, but I start getting a little concerned, I a bet. lot concerned. I bet. Did you, did you tell me that you, after maybe, I, I, I'm thinking this is after you found the phone on the printer and you found that the surfboard, it, then we should be clear, the surfboard wasn't just off the wall. It was missing, and it's going to come up later, right. but it, it was not in the surfboard, it was not in the house. Right. Okay. Did you end up calling one of uh, JR's friends at that point? I did. Okay. I and what did. happened I there? Called, I called them and and told them what was going on. Well, first, you know, I really couldn't even tell you if I said, you know, to them, have you seen JR? I don't think I said that at all. I called them to say, hey, I came home from work and 
JR wasn't here, his phone's here. I told them exactly what was going on, and they, they too thought it was weird, and they immediately came over. And they came over, and in the meantime, did you happen to notice anything else that looked out of place or, or missing, anything else? I mean, obviously, I know you're already freaked out at this point. Anything else that, that added to that? No, not at this point. Okay. Just the surfboard was gone. His phone was here, and he was gone. Truck was gone. He was gone. Surfboard gone, and phone was home, which made no sense. Uh, but did you tell me that maybe his medication that was was there did that alarm you? Would that did he usually take his medication when he went places? Or I what about honestly that? didn't even look to see if his medication was was there at this point. Okay. It was later after I spoke with the police that, that I checked. They actually, you know, asked me if there were was anything such as medication that he sh- could have with him. And that's when I went and looked and found out that his medication was indeed still at the house. Uh, would this medic, if he was, let's just say, if he was going to be gone, how often would he have to take this medication? Every day, well, every two was- days, or? Daily. Daily. Okay, so maybe he could have gone somewhere and left it at home if he'd already taken his medicine for that day. Is that possible? Yes. Okay. So JR's friends uh, come over, uh, but you start making phone calls. What do you do next? Um, well, I also we meet, I called the police because, you know, people say, well, why would you call the police? I'm like, I mean, the jails, I'm sorry. The jails, I'm like, I don't know. I'm just calling to see if they've seen a Gerald J.R. Mollahan. I called jails and hospitals and nothing. And, and his friends were helping me call as well. We called hospitals um, up and down the East Coast. I don't know why, but we just did. Oh, because the police probably told me to, because I had called the police as well, and they told mm-hmm. me I should call the hospitals, and I did call hospitals, but I had already called jails. Obviously, if I'm talking to the police, we know he wasn't in jail. Did you happen to maybe go to your neighbors and see if they saw anything, if maybe somebody came over to the house, you know, after no, he got think, home, Any anything like that? No, I mean, we were friends with our neighbors, but we didn't have neighbors that we socialized with. Even if you didn't go over there, anything, any time after that did any of them come over and say well we saw jr came home and then um no not at this point it wasn't until it was um publicly on the news that he was missing that a neighbor did come forth and say that or called me and said that she had seen him that morning of course her timeline was off obviously because later on we found out what time he had been um clocked Okay. Going through a local um, toll booth, and we're yeah, we're going to get to that. Yes, that's that's some very good information there, and, and we're going to get to that in a moment. So you're calling these hospitals, jails, nothing, just nothing. Nobody, nothing. nobody is, um, nothing uh, it, it good is happening. Uh, so once you, what did you do for the rest of the day? Once you used up all those phone numbers, did you kind of sit there with his friends and kind of try to? brainstorm or where he could have gone? Oh, yeah. we, were, we were making calls. Um, well, I made a few calls, but um, his friend was making some calls as well. But I, I called the police back. It was like, by this time it was 8 p.m. and I called the police back and said, you know, I've called every hospital I can think of on the East Coast, you know, in the general vicinity within 100 miles, I should say, and nothing. And then I think I had told him, you know, that I found his phone. Maybe at this point I didn't tell him I found the phone. I don't know. Some of it, you know, I remember clearly. Some of yeah. it's a little sketchy. I understand. I, I understand that, Julie. No, um, just do the best you can. That's all we can ask. So, but still it hasn't been 24 hours. I'm not sure how seriously, frankly, the police are going to take it right at this time, but uh, I'm going to guess that you didn't get a lot of sleep that night, but the police did show up uh, the next day. Didn't... First thing in the morning. Okay. And uh, you you filled out this report uh, with them that, of course, asks you uh, a, bu- a, a bunch of questions. Uh, yeah, be... They showed up with... Please. 
they showed up with the forensics, um, forensics and everybody. I mean, it was, it was on from this point, um, homicide detectives, forensic, everything, because at this point we knew something was wrong. And do you believe that they put like a kind of a be on the lookout for his truck? And of course, with the license plate number. He did by, I'd say, so this would be now August 4th. By the end of the day, I think they had put out an APB. And I just have to, what were you thinking at this time? Did I know that your mind was racing. It's all very surprising, as it is in most disappearance cases. But did you, at this point, have a knee-jerk reaction, one thing that maybe you kind of settled on as to what could have happened at that point? Not until not until the morning of August 5th. And we're going to get to that next, but I just want to ask you one more question. And I, uh, when the police were talking to you, did, did you ever get the idea, maybe they thought that, and I have to ask this, that you might be involved in his disappearance? I never got that feeling, um, and I never even thought that they thought it until later on. I realized they probably did, but they never really acted like they did. Okay. I think my friend was, I have to laugh because my friend, she's like, what are forensics doing here? You don't think you killed her? And I'm like, Lord, oh, I don't want to say her name, but I'm like. Yeah, um, that's fine. No, that's just protocol. They're bringing um, forensics. To look for evidence. Yes. She was so funny. She cracked me up. Yes, yes. Well, I have to ask that because in some disappearance cases, spouses can be very good suspects, frankly. And as the listeners know, relationships in general are are a pretty well known uh, motivation for disappearances as well. Just have to ask that. Unfortunately, after he went missing, I have learned that, but. Just to be on the, just to make this straight, they never took you downtown and kind of put the bright light yeah. on you and said, "What did you do to your husband?" That's never happened. Just to be to the extreme, no. never. Okay. No. Okay. So they have this um, lookout for him and his truck, and the good news is that the truck was found. Why don't you tell the listeners about how that happened? What everything that you know about that. Well, that was when things really, 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 I would say more than freaked me out, but really got real for me when they got a call from a sheriff in North Carolina stating that they had found his truck on the beach in Corolla, North Carolina. And that's when my heart sank because now I knew something was wrong. I mean, up until this point, he was missing, his truck was missing. But I wasn't worried that there was something, you know, critically wrong with him. But now that there's a truck, a surfboard, and no JR, now I'm thinking, okay, something's happened to my husband. Who did what to my husband? Now, we should maybe be a little uh, more descriptive on it. When you say that it was found in Corolla, North Carolina, first of all, approximately how far is that away from where you live in Norfolk, Virginia? About an hour and a half to two hours. Okay. And in this section of North Carolina, people are allowed to drive their cars on the beach. It wasn't in a parking lot. It was actually sitting on the beach by the water. Yes, on the beach at mile marker 16. Okay, and I've I've Googled uh, that location, and there are people who live there. There are many buildings and, and, uh, and uh, other establishments there. Uh, how was it found, and uh, who found it? Well... Um, it was actually spotted from the Monday that he went missing, but there was not a missing persons report out on the, you know, with the license plate that connected it to this missing person. So as the sheriff, you know, divulged to me that a lot of times trucks are abandoned on the beach, they run out of gas, you know, and they have to get somebody out there to tow it. So it wasn't unusual to find a, an abandoned vehicle on the beach. But as soon as the um, APB went out, and I guess they ran the plates again, and they connected it with my husband's missing person report, then boom, then, you know, then it was on. Then we knew, you know, from North Carolina to Norfolk, they contacted, 
you know, the sheriff in North, uh, excuse me, North Carolina contacted the Norfolk detectives. So. And you had already said that it, that a local, and we won't give his name. I know you know his name, but we're not going to give his name. Uh, some local insists that the the truck was down there the same day that Jr. disappeared. Yes. On the third, he had actually spotted it on the third. Didn't think anything of it. Again, it's not unusual, but he just remembered seeing it, and you know, he just said that yes, he did see it that day. And you've had an opportunity to talk to this guy in person. I had, oddly okay. enough. And do you find him to be uh, believable? Any any oh, suspicions yeah. of him? Anything like that? No. No. He's just exactly. being a helpful a citizen. Yeah, and he's a minister. And he just happened to start it. Like I said, he didn't think anything of it. So later on... When he found out that the truck belonged to a missing person, he was a bit shocked. I bet. Did Did he ever say if he, there were any other vehicles around the truck? How busy was the beach that day? How many people? Did he remember anything like that? Well, he didn't specifically say, but it's a tourist beach. I mean, they have um, wild horse tours on that beach all day long. So, I mean, that beach is packed from sun up to sundown. So it's not like somebody couldn't have seen him or the truck. That's another yeah. thing that's so strange. It's like somebody had to have seen him. I would I would I would have to uh, I would have to agree with you, Julie. Um were you and he familiar with this area of North Carolina? Had you or he ever been there before? Actually we had of course he was more familiar with it than I was. I had only been there twice and I actually, in the same truck, he taught me how to drive the truck on the beach. It was one of the funnest days ever. Okay, so he had been there before. He knew how to drive down there. Um, not a strange place for for him. So once the truck uh, was found, did you go down there? And what was found in the truck? Well, I didn't get to see the truck for a couple of weeks. But I went down to the beach uh, with a friend that knew JR. Actually, I had never met the guy. He contacted me and took me down there to speak to the sheriff and um, hopefully get to see the truck, which I did not get to see. But the sheriff did drive me to the spot where the truck was located, drove me around different areas to show me, you know, some of the houses where they had gone door to door asking people, which they had, um, mm -hmm. but nobody had any information. And what was in the truck? Uh, being that the surfboard was something that was missing from your house, was it in the truck? And were any of his other clothes, wallet, anything else? Of course, we know the phone was still at your house, but anything else? Well, when they um, took the truck into um, possession, the surfboard was in the back of the truck. It was out of its case. There was sand in the um, bed of the truck, sand on the surfboard. And this is, of course, what they had told me before I even saw the truck. And inside of the truck, he had a towel laid across the driver's seat. There was sand on the floorboard of the driver's seat. And his tennis shoes, socks, and T-shirt were folded up in, on the back seat of the truck. And his wallet was in the truck. The truck was locked, actually. I, um, when they told me they found the truck, mm -hmm. I told them how to get into the truck because we had had a secret way that we can get in. Okay. In case we get locked out. So thank God, because that's how they were able to get in the truck and tow it to the police compound. Was You said that the, the, the surfboard, though, was in a bag. Was the bag in the truck, or did he leave the bag at home? No, it was in the back of the truck. Was, the surfboard was in the back, and this bag that you put a surfboard in was in, in the back as well. Are you pretty yeah. sure that the surfboard was used that day? Well, other than the fact that it had sand on it, we don't have any actual proof. Nobody actually saw him out in the water because nobody's come forward to say they saw him. But mm -hmm. based on the fact that there was sand on the surfboard, um, because surfboards are covered in, in surf wax, and there was sand on the board, sand in the truck, and sand uh, in the bed of the truck, and on the floorboard of the driver's seat. So in a roundabout way, they kind of determined, well, it does seem that at some point 
the surfboard was out of the back of the truck and might have been in the water, uh, but nobody saw that. Right. Nobody saw that. Okay. So are you saying that on that day, although the truck was seen, nobody actually saw JR? Well, nobody has come forth to say they've Mm. seen him, so no. Okay. And the police or this local guy, have they ever been able to tell you how crowded the beach? Now, granted, it's not a Saturday. It's August, but it's not a Monday. You know, it's not a Saturday or Sunday. It's a Monday. Uh, How crowded would the beach have been that day? Any ideas? Well, it's August, which is summer, and Mm -hmm. so it really doesn't matter. Uh, Monday would be still a busy day, and I do know that the um, wild horse tours were running that day, So, and they have like 16 vehicles that go out and make continuous runs with people to go see the wild horses. And what kind of day was August 3rd? Was it, was it a nice day, or did it rain? Do you remember? No, it was a nice day. Of course, this is all later I find this out, but it was a nice day. The water was calm. Mm-hmm. Um, which is another strange thing to me, you know, thinking back, my husband was so meticulous. If he was going to go surf, he would have already looked it up online to see if there was any surf to surf on. He wouldn't have driven all that way if he thought it was just going to be calm conditions. Correct. You don't think? I'd have to agree with you. So anything else unusual about the truck that that you can think of uh, at this point? Well, if we were, you know, moving forward to the point okay. where I've been regained possession of the truck, yes. Okay, well then, yeah, let's talk about that. Did you get the truck back? Yes, um, about three weeks later, I did get the truck back and, you know, because they had to go through it and run prints and just check everything out in the truck. So when I got it back, I told them, you know, I'm going to be looking for what's not in the truck. While they were looking for clues in the truck, I was going to be looking for what wasn't in the truck. And so when I got it back, I was a bit surprised to find out that his cup that he normally took with him, no matter where he went, even if it was the grocery store, he took um, ginger ale on ice because he had a dry throat condition. Um, There was no food wrapper, food receipt, because, as I said before, my husband was pre-diabetic and he would have low blood sugars. And he had a pair of Banana Republic sunglasses, or Panama Jack, I'm not sure, um, without looking at my paper, Mm -hmm. that I had just recently purchased for him. They were not in the truck. And he carried a pocket knife with him everywhere he went. And I already knew it wasn't at the house because, believe me, I had been through his room. And it wasn't at home, so I expected to find it in the truck, not in the truck. So if this man was going to go surfing and swimming, he would have taken the knife off, and it would would have been found in the truck, and it was not there. Yeah, and you also got to wonder, would he go out if, you know, let's just say, he goes out and says, oh, I bring the surf, surfboard the whole way down here. And it's calm condition. He put the surfboard back in the truck. And if he went out just to swim by himself, it's hard to imagine he would have worn sunglasses out there to swim. Correct. Or his knife. Or his knife, right. So those were some things that were missing at the time. And since August 3rd, 2015, you've never seen any of those things again. No. And I've actually moved since then. So... If his knife or sunglasses were to be found, they would have been found when I was packing up his his belongings, and I still didn't find him. You had mentioned that so you got the truck back. Uh, do you still have the truck? Did you sell the truck? Where is the truck yeah, now? I have the truck. You do? Okay. I do. That has to be a little uh, – is that a little strange for you, Julie? Um, no, actually, as strange as it might sound, I find great comfort driving it. It's like when I get in the driver's seat, I just feel like, you know, this is where he sat driving this truck. I just kind of feel like he's got his arms wrapped around me whenever I'm driving the truck. That sounds nice. Okay, I can understand. Okay, I can understand that then. If you want to look at it that way, sure. Okay. You did have his phone. Uh, when you went through the phone, 
Of course, he left it at home, so we know he didn't take it to North Carolina. Just to be, just because I have to ask these questions, did you find any uh, phone calls or texts that kind of caught your attention? None. And actually, um, going back to the day that the detectives came to the house, on August 4th, they actually took his phone and his computer and they took it down and had some experts go in. And I don't know exactly what they did, but they were looking for things that maybe we couldn't see on the surface, you know, things that may have been deleted or what have you, and they couldn't find anything either. So if if police detectives didn't find anything, I sure wasn't going to. Right. And you had an opportunity to look at the phone yourself just to see... Uh, had he made any Correct. phone calls uh, after he dropped no. you off that morning? Any texts that he received or sent out after? Any use of his phone after he dropped you off at work that morning? Um, actually, just actually one phone call with a message, and that was from the person from the bank saying that sorry that you know that she missed their telephone appointment, and you know give her a call back. And do you know what t- time that uh, took place? Was that Early in the morning, or would that have been later that afternoon? I you think know? it was early in the morning, between 9 and 10. So already at that point, uh, he was the, he, if we're to think that he's alive and, and doing something, already he's didn't take that phone call. Correct. Because if he dropped you off at 827, he would have been home by what, maybe 20 till 9, maybe something like that? Um. With traffic, at the most, 10 minutes from our house. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, he's home. And if we're to believe that he just decided he was going to go down to the beach for a day, um, grabs his surfboard, jumps in. And we're going to get to the, the timing of all this in a moment. But um, either way, he didn't pick up his phone when the bank called. Correct. Okay. And you continue to pay the bill on that phone, don't you? I do, because that way I can call it and hear his voice on the voicemail. Let's get into um, maybe some of these other things. Maybe we should start here. Did you ever have an opportunity? So he had an appointment with the with this group session at 10 a.m. that morning. Have you ever had an opportunity to speak to the person or persons running that group session? Uh, were they concerned when he didn't show up? What can you say about that? Um, I did try to call, but because of HIPAA, they could not really tell me anything. But I, I do know the detectives talked to a lot of a lot of people, so I know the detectives talked to them, and and even the t- detectives were only to get able to get so much information because of HIPAA. So, and we've already brought up that the actual conditions in North Carolina at the shore that day were very calm, no waves. And you say that JR would have checked that before going down there. We've already covered that. What did the, I don't know if it was the chief of police or a sheriff down there, if we are to think that maybe the JR did go out into the water and possibly drown, what was the uh, law enforcement's opinion on that down there? Well, a few days after they had done a thorough search, because I kept questioning them why, you know, they had told me that they thought 98% chance that he had probably drowned. And I'm like, well, if he drowned, where's his body? Because, I, you know, I'm not, I know that if you drown, your body washes ashore. And he did tell me sometimes it can take, you know, a few days, a few weeks at this point, and then, so I'm just waiting, you know, after they've done their search, and now at this point, I'm just waiting, it sounds terrible, for his body to wash ashore, if indeed he did drown, Mm -hmm. and nothing. So, the sheriff later told me that, you know, there is one known case in the history at that beach that they never recovered the body, but I just, I just don't believe that he drowned. Right, and people, if they want to do a Google search for um, people who have you know, gotten lost in water, it's pretty obvious that people who go missing in the water, maybe a boating accident or, once again, uh, swimming and drowning, maybe a riptide, something like that, 
Julie is absolutely correct that those people are eventually found. Unfortunately, they are, de they are deceased, but their bodies usually turn up somewhere. Correct. And in but in Jr.'s case, uh, nothing. No clothes, no sunglasses, no knife, nothing. No, and they sent um, sonar, you know, divers and sonar out there, and they found nothing. Yeah, and on top of the fact that if it was a beautiful day and there weren't many waves, there wouldn't have been any sort of riptide or anything that would have drug them out, you know, pushed them away from shore. It sounds like a, a pretty good day to go swimming. Correct, and their their theory was if he did drown and he if he got somehow stuck into some stuff is what they said, um, that maybe he was stuck and he couldn't, you know, float to the surface. So that's why they put out their sonar. And you've even entertained the idea, even if uh, there might have been a shark out there, but even in that you believe, and the sheriff believes, that there would still be some remains that would eventually come ashore. Somebody would see them. Correct. Now here's another uh you kind of uh, mentioned it a little a little bit earlier. Uh this is going to help all of us with the timing of everything that happened that morning. At what point you got something in the mail? I don't know if it was a month later, a couple months later. What did you get and what did it say? It was a bill from Elizabeth Rivers um Elizabeth River Tolls and it was a bill for him for the morning of August 3rd when he went through and didn't pay a toll. Huh. And there was a picture, snapped, which I guess is normal, of the back of his truck as it went through because it snapped the driver's license or the license plate number. That in and of itself, to me, I was like, what? The time stamp on there? The fact that JR go through and not pay? That's not my husband. He wouldn't do that. That would be like stealing is what he would say. If he went through and didn't yeah. pay. Um. And you couldn't see anybody in the truck, let alone my husband, because of the high headrest on the back of the truck. You can't see anybody's head. So when originally the police told me it didn't look like anybody was in the truck with him, when I saw the picture, I'm like, well, it doesn't even look like he's in the truck. So how do you know who's in the truck? Could you see the yeah. surfboard in the truck? Um, was the surfboard sticking out maybe the back? I mean, this is a big yes. Steve, this is like a, a four-door big F-150 truck, right? I've seen the pictures of Correct. it. Yep. Long bed on it. Uh, would the surfboard stick out the back, or could you place the, the, the surfboard flat on the bed of the truck? No, you couldn't lay it flat because he has a um, truck toolbox on the back, right, sure. but you could see it, the very tip of it the way he had it angled in there, you could see the surfboard in there. Okay, cause so you could see that on the picture? Correct. Okay. Do you, did you, they ever give you a copy of that picture for your records? I do have a copy. I wish I knew where it was, but because I've moved, I couldn't locate okay. it. I was going to look okay. at it again, but I haven't located it yet. Okay, well, if you find it, uh, I'd love to see it. Just just to just and then I would like to publicize it for my listeners just so they can get that in their mind as well. So what we're saying is that uh he blew this toll, he was on the highway, got I had to get off at an exit and just completely blew it. So he didn't have like an easy pass or anything like that. No. And what what did the timestamp say on the picture that was shown to you uh about him blowing this toll? Well, without being able to look at the picture, all I know is I calculated it. It was like 42 minutes. So if he left me at 827, add 42 minutes to that, I think it was like nine. Mm -hmm. Let's do the 33 plus nine is 909. It would have been 909. Yeah. Does that sound possible i i we and we did it and we'll get to that in a second but for him to drop you off i guess go home maybe change clothes or something get that surfboard off the wall take it down to the truck and then get down there to that exit is it possible to do that what you would understand is monday morning traffic in your area does that sound believable no, not to me, again, because the surfboard wasn't just hanging on the wall. It was wired 
to those hooks. Mm-hmm. So it would have he would have had to have been like in a race. Really been heavy on the gas to get down there, uh, to get down there and and go through that toll at that time. Right. Okay. Would he have needed any tools to take that uh, surfboard off? When you say it was wrapped with wires, would he need a pair of pliers or a screwdriver? What do you remember about it being hung up there? He would have needed wire cutters to get it down that quickly. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you would have had to have un- unwound the wire. Okay. And as you remember the wires now, were they cut or did they look like they were just unwound? Do you remember? I don't remember. But actually, let me just walk across the room. I have this surfboard sitting in my living room in its bag. Oh, it looks like I took the wires off. Oh, wait, here's one of the wires. Cut. They were cut. All right, so he did cut them. So that would have saved at least a few minutes. Yep. Okay. But we don't know, of course, traffic in Norfolk. I know Norfolk's a busy place, Uh, and the people should know that I did Google it, and when I Googled it, but it was in the evening, wasn't rush hour, you could do it in that time, but I'm not sure you could do it on a Monday morning. You know, at the time, you would have been trying to do that at 9 with people going to work and things. So it's tight. Yeah. It's, it's It's a tight window. Um. To be honest with you, uh, just to ask, do you know that JR had ever blown a toll before anywhere? No. No. Again, he he would have said that stealing, you know, he would have been yeah. in a not judgmental sort of way. He would have just been like, that's stealing. How dare them or something. Regarding, uh, of course, he, he did have his wallet, and the wallet was found in the car. Is that right? Wallet was found? Correct. It was did- in the truck. Did you ever get any bills of him spending any money for gas or food, drinks, anywhere that morning after he dropped you off? No, nothing. Nothing. So we have this kind of tight window. You kind of got this bill. not. um, Maybe I should ask you this. Being that you did know that the uh, truck was in North Carolina, did it ever occur to you that he would have had to have gone through a toll to get down there? Um, not really, because there's two routes to get there. One is through the toll, so you can get there quicker, and one is around the toll, but it's really only like a five to eight minute difference, I mm. guess. I mean, I haven't actually drove, driven down there since, so I'm just guessing, because I usually take the old route. Okay. So that was a, do you think that, say, if you two decided to go down there, would going taking the toll be the way he would drive, or yes. it would have been? All right. So but, I mean, I wasn't thinking that when he went missing because you know I didn't even know where he was at first, and then when they found the truck, I, I wasn't even thinking about the toll or anything. Of course, you weren't until I got that bill in the mail, and that was, I mean, that day was like took me back to. Um, the day that they found his truck, and I have to tell you, the day he went missing was bad, but the day he found his truck, that that was the worst day oh, because worst. that was when it really hit home that something was wrong. And and the day I got the bill in the mail it was almost like going back to that day because I'm looking at the truck and looking at the time, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, what's going on here? This doesn't make sense. And I was kind of freaking out again, realizing that now it made even less sense for him to have left me, dropped me off at work and made it to the toll at this time. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, the the police did take the truck. They looked at it. I mean, to your knowledge, I don't know if to tell you or not, but did they find any strange fingerprints in it? Uh, did they find his fingerprints in it that looked like the truck might have been wiped down? Do you know? No, they just said they found my prints and his prints all over the truck, which would be normal. Yeah, that would be normal. Yes, it would be. Okay, so we have the truck. We have some things uh, that are missing. We have these very calm conditions down there. Uh, the odds of finding uh, maybe a drowning victim are fairly good, I'd say. Once again, the toll bill that kind of breaks down the time of 
Uh, if we're to believe that he was driving the truck, that he blew this toll, uh, kind of went through the easy pass lane without an easy pass. This takes us to something that we talked about earlier. And once again, uh, JR has two daughters, uh, one that it seemingly he got along well with, but I don't think that they saw a lot of each other. And then this younger daughter, Kelly, how did she react to all of this? Well, I think I heard from her on the 5th, the day when they found his truck, um, when I was in North Carolina driving around with the sheriff there, she called me, um, which I was just totally shocked because I hadn't heard from her in so long. She called me crying and um, saying, I didn't mean to hurt him, I didn't mean to hurt him. And at the time, I wasn't even thinking about the implications of what she was saying you know, because my husband's missing, and I'm just worried, you know, where is my husband? And the fact that she's calling instead of, like, hanging up on her because she hadn't talked to her father in so long, which is normal for me, I'm trying to comfort her. Like, it's okay, Mm -hmm. it's okay, you know. Uh And it was later on, you know, after the fact that I thought how odd it was that she was saying I didn't mean to hurt him. So then I started to think, oh, my gosh, did she do something to him? So I did call the detectives and, you know, ask if they had investigated her, and they said that they had indeed investigated her. And did she have uh, an alibi for that morning? Um, The detectives didn't specifically tell me that, but they just said that they investigated her and that she checked out. Okay. And in fact, when she called you to say these words about, I didn't mean to hurt him, whatever that may mean, you were actually with the sheriff down in North Carolina when this happened. Correct. Driving in his SUV on the beach. And so he was a party to you talking to her, and so he can verify, maybe he couldn't hear the end of the con, her side of the conversation, but he can verify that she called and, you know, she kind of made a couple strange statements. Once again, we don't know what exactly she meant. How did she even find out that her father was missing? Well, at this point, it was all over the news. It was. So did she ever tell you that's how she found out, or did you just take that for granted? I I just took it for granted. I I honestly didn't even think about it. I just, I guess, Mm -hmm. I just didn't think about it. She just, I'm just now thinking, you know, she probably heard it on the news. Because How bad? You know, Jr. I'm sorry. Please go ahead, please. I was going to say, you know, Jr. At this point, isn't just a missing person. He's a missing retired Norfolk firefighter, and the Norfolk police are looking for him. And you know, police and firefighters—they're like brothers. So now this is out all over the news. Yeah. So when she called you. She didn't say something, hey, I just said, heard on the news that my father's missing. Why didn't you call me? Anything Did that ever come out of her mouth? Anything like that? No, she just called crying. Um, actually, I should say sobbing. I didn't mean to hurt him. I didn't mean to hurt him. And, of course, you know, that doesn't mean that she hurt him physically. Kind of, yeah. Or, yeah. I just... She could have meant that being that they had this um, not a very positive relationship that she knew that she hurt him by the, the her behavior with her son and, Correct. you know, kind of playing keep away with her son when it came to G- JR. Correct. Okay, she, she could have meant that. It can be, just depends on your, I guess, point of view on it, but it could, you could take a couple different meanings from it. Um, maybe we need to go into this deeper. How nasty had it gotten between her and J.R.? They actually went to court, didn't they? They did. In 2011, um, a sheriff, well, somebody knocked at her door, rang the doorbell, we answered the door. It was a sheriff, and he was being served with papers that she was a, had gone down and applied for a um, protective order so that he could not see her son. She claimed that he threatened to kill her, which he did not. We actually proved in court that 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 is not what happened. Um, But because, you know, they have to err on the side of caution and because, honestly, um, women can go down to the court and say somebody tried to kill them and 
soon. You've got a restraining order. So it gotten nasty between her and Jr. He was she was trying to keep her son away from Jr. Uh, it sounds okay. to me like like some uh, lies were being created. Uh, but oh, yeah. at, the, at the time that Jr. disappeared, did he ha- have any? Did he have permission to see his grandson? And when was the last time he saw his grandson before he disappeared? Oh no, because um, when that order was almost up. Um, she went out and took out another warrant against him. Somehow, Jr.'s email had been hacked, and emails were sent out, and even I had gotten one from some kind of a weird place, some, some kind of raspberry diet thing, and it just said, hello, and if you clicked on it, it actually showed you that it was from this raspberry diet thing, but his name was associated with it, so she took that as communication and started communicating with him. Little did he know or I know that, you know, we were under the assumption she broke the order because she's now communicating with him. So he started talking with her. This was in 2013. Mm -hmm. It was actually before we got married because we went down to court right before, a month before we got married. But so she started out with her um, emails saying, you know, if you ever want to see your grandson again, then you have to get rid of that, um, what she called me, because I was born with the birth defect of my right arm, that chicken wing arm girlfriend of yours. And, and of course, that just made him so mad because he just could not believe that somebody of his flesh and bones could be so hateful. So he was angry. So, of course, he sent her back an angry email and text and may have called her, I don't know, without him here to verify it. But So she went down and lodged another complaint against him. So he was filed with another restraining order. So how long had it been since he he saw his grandson when he disappeared in 2015? It had been, unfortunately, four years. Oh, my. I felt so bad for him because he loved his grandson. Oh, my. So that could have meant been what she meant by it didn't mean to hurt him. Maybe. And we have to remind the listeners that at the time that J.R. disappeared, Kelly lived 10 minutes away. Um, so there's that. Uh, just uh, for the listeners' knowledge, and I know you didn't know about her social life, is uh, is it possible that she had any a man or men in her life that if she did have something against her father that it could have assisted her in doing something to JR? Anybody, of course, no names, but does anybody come to mind? Nobody I can think of. Okay, and, and I'm guessing being that you hadn't, uh, JR hadn't seen his grandson in four years, then, of course, you or he wouldn't know anything about her social life either. About who she was dating or anything else. So Right. Well, no, we did know she was married or engaged or married. We didn't know which, but she was with a man. Okay, so she did have a guy in in her life. Yeah, but he he would, I would never in a million years think anything of this this man doing anything to harm anybody. In fact, he would probably have her arrested if he thought she was going to do something like that. But I also, just to play devil's advocate, I just also wonder what kind of guy would date a a woman who wouldn't let her father see her son for four years, too. Well, that's true. So, And I always say, and what kind of mother would allow her daughter to do that? Yeah, of course, we haven't even brought up JR's uh, ex-wives in any of this. Uh, maybe we should just cover that right now. Any suspicion that one of them could have had something to do with his disappearance? Um, no, not really. Although, no, not really. Okay. Okay. But I was just going to say, although nothing in this world would surprise me, but of course, n- but of I course can't not. Use that. Right. <laughs> But nothing that really comes to mind uh, as far as having the opportunity 
or or anything like that. Anything that you've ever heard since August of 2015 would ever lead you to believe that any of his ex-wives had anything to do with it. Um, let's put it this way. Was he fighting with any of his ex-wives the way he was fighting with his da- daughter? Well, he his daughter's um, mother, which would have been his second wife, they were at odds as well because she supported her daughter in doing all of this. And I believe that she did it. Her modus operandi was because then she could have full access to the grandchild because I think the, the daughter and that mother were jealous of the relationship that J.R. had with his grandson. Okay. And maybe I need to ask you this. At the time of J.R.'s disappearance, were there any court proceedings going on where it looked like this could get changed, where he might have some access to his grandson, that somebody might no. be worried about that? No. In in fact, after she had said those really um, nasty, ugly things about me, he told me that he didn't care if he ever saw his daughter again and if he has to wait until his grandson is 18, that he would just wait because he didn't want anything else to do with his daughter you know, because of the ugly things that she had said. Okay, so we have the daughter that uh, he, he, this probably going back to Jair's depress, depression probably didn't help his depression any. Oh no, it didn't. No, it might have been a, a large source of it. In fact, in a matter as a matter of fact, actually, it, it is the first restraining order is what sent him into a deep depression, which is the depression that he was feeling when he when he started taking the Percocet. And that's what kind of brought him out of that depression. Okay. Speaking of, excuse me, please go ahead. I said, unfortunately, I mean, meaning that you have to take a, 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 a opioid to treat your depression. That's just depressing. Yeah. And speaking of Percocet, this is uh, something, once again, we need to talk about anybody in Jarrah's life that, Maybe he had a disagreement with anything suspicious in his life. Um, we talked about his Percocet addiction early in this inter- interview, but uh, he was getting that drug kind of off the books. Um, and tell the listeners a little bit about that situation. When did you first find out about it? And who was this person who was getting the drugs for Jr.? Well, it was a friend of his and a friend of mine, um, but it wasn't until the night that J.R. came to me to tell me that he was addicted to them that he divulged the fact that he had been purchasing from this person um, and, you know, that now he wanted to seek treatment. And he had cut this person out of his life when he decided to get off the opioids um, this person was now no longer a part of their lives because, you know, he didn't want them around because now he's trying to get away from the opioids. Yeah. So you knew this uh, person, too. At any time, did you ever suspect that this guy was uh, getting Percocet to JR through the black market? No. Not at all. Was this somebody that was already a J- uh, friend of JR's when you first met him? Yes. It was. And do you have any idea how long this guy had been supplying JR uh, with these this extra Percocet that was above and beyond the subscription that JR ever had? To my knowledge, it was maybe, and this is just a guess, mm-hmm. maybe uh, a year maybe. I'm not even sure. Any idea looking back at how much JR was spending on these drugs you know, per day? Any ideas? Not really, because Jr. and I had a separate bank accounts. He had his own money, and I had my own money. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have no idea. Okay. So Jr. had to get this particular guy out of his life if he wanted to get clean. Uh, how did this guy react to it? Did he try to get back in Jr.'s life? Because generally, push drug pushers, whether legal or illegal or illegal generally don't like it when their clients, you know, try to go clean, get sober. How did it go? Well, not that JR ever mentioned. I just know um, that there was no issue, to my knowledge. Any idea the, if that guy might have come around when you weren't at home or 
Did you ever have an inkling that uh, maybe this guy was back in JR's life before he disappeared? Any Ever had any suspicions like that? No. None. And, I mean, of course, for me to say it, honestly, JR would tell me. But, again, I'm finding out people don't know certain things. But as far as sure. I know, no. Do you have any idea if the police ever looked into this guy? Did you ever give them his name? Maybe you might want to check this guy out. Any... You know, I'm, I do believe that they may have checked into him, but you know, to be honest, I don't know. I'm going to have to call and ask him. Yeah, because uh, as the listeners know, as I've talked about before in other interviews, that uh, drug addiction and uh, drug dealers, whether once again, whether legal or illegal drugs, heroin or Percocet, um, a lot of disappearances have to do with drugs. Whether it's whether it's people going clean and the, and the drug dealers not liking that, or somebody who is a a junkie continues to you know the addiction keeps getting worse and they go somewhere to buy drugs something something happens it it plays a huge part I'd say not quite in fifty percent of the cases I've covered but definitely forty percent um, has that has that ever occurred to you in thinking about the last two and a half years that maybe that had something to do this guy had something to do with Jarrah's disappearance. No, that never even entered my mind. Okay. So we've gone through all these facts. Uh, I, I know that some people maybe are going to think that maybe he went down there, went for a swim, and his body just hap- didn't happen to be discovered. Of course, I covered a case a couple months ago, the disappearance of Tiffany Daniels right here in Florida, who her car was found at the beach, and some people continue to believe that she went for a swim and wasn't found. Still not sure what happened in that case. Others are going to believe maybe it's the um, daughter. Something else happened. And of course, um, Jaywar was trying to recover from his issues, but sometimes people do relapse. What is, what's it been like for you for the last two and a half years, Julie? What have you thought about all this? How, how have you felt? Well, it's been a it's been a roller coaster. It's been basically living hell. I mean, sometimes I don't sleep for days. I mean, this started in the beginning, like the first week. I don't think I slept or ate for a week. Um, then it just got to the point where I just kind of collapsed and finally slept. But nothing has changed since he went missing. It's still just an everyday roller coaster. You know, if I hear the doorbell, and he doesn't even know where I live, if he were alive. But, like, at first, I couldn't even leave my house when he first went missing. I was afraid he might come home, and I wouldn't be there, or the police would come. But I still, when I'm driving places now, I thought I was crazy until I found out that it happens to people, loved ones of the missing. But I swear to God that, you know, he's like, that's Jr. That looks just like Jr. And I have to turn the truck around and go make sure it's not him. And Really, I was thinking I was going crazy some of these times. I would tell my daughter, look, you're not going to look like JR. She's like, it's all right, Mom, it's not JR. Mm-hmm. And like I found out that I'm not alone in this. No, you're not. No, you're not. Uh, since you got the toll bill, has there any been any new information regarding JR's disappearance since that toll bill, like I said, that you got a month later or whatever it was? No, no new information. Um, although, you know, we were talking about restraining orders. I did run into his daughter at a 7-Eleven while getting gas about a year ago in March. Mm-hmm. Yeah, please tell the listeners. I forgot about that. Please tell the listeners about that. Well, I had just finished pumping the gas. I was heading to um, the office for one of the companies I work for. I'm a home health nurse, um, emergency on-call nurse. And I just finished pumping the gas, and I heard a voice say, have you heard anything about my dad? And I'm looking around like, what? And it was his daughter, Kelly, and she came up to the truck and said, so have you heard anything about my dad? And, of course, I really didn't even want to speak to her because she's She's just very volatile. Um, And I'm like, no, I haven't heard a thing. And she proceeded to tell me 
how her mom was talking to the detectives. And first of all, I know the detectives weren't talking to her mom because they already told me they would only speak with me. Um, and then she started telling me about a gun that she had and using her hands, telling me it's this big and I'm not afraid to use it. So I went down and filed a protective order against her, but she went into court and lied and said that she never said that. She never owned a gun, never shot a gun. And fortunately, if it ever happens again, I was able to obtain pictures of her shooting a gun and conversations from her Facebook telling people if they wanted to go to the range, she had plenty of toys and ammo. Huh. And also there was a time, like from the time you went missing, when she called that very first time and, you know, crying, I didn't mean to hurt him. I had only heard from her one other time after that, and that was a text that said, so have we any news? And that was it. That was it. Mm -hmm. And until that encounter at the 7-Eleven, that was the third time I had heard from her since he went missing. And was, the, I guess, this interaction with her at the 7-Eleven and things afterward, that's the last time you've had any communication with her? Correct. Okay, so she herself has not played really any role in trying to find out what happened to her father. You've been the one, the, the, the uh, leader concerning that? Correct. You had sent me, and we're not going to divulge. You you don't have to divulge the uh, contents of them if you don't want to. But I think I mentioned earlier that you actually kept a journal uh, from the virtually the beginning of when this happened. Uh, what what caused you to do that? And I, I think it's a great idea, by the way. I, I I'm think sorry. What did you say? I said uh, you've been keeping a journal. Oh since, yeah. Since the begin since when this happened, I think that's a spectacular idea because. I think the emotions and things that happen in those first few days, people can forget them over time, and they can be useful later. Uh, what caused you to do that? Um, maybe tell the listeners a little about that, because I think that's the first we've run across that in a case. Well, because I'm a, a writer, I write poetry, and I just love to write. It helps me express myself. And because I thought, you know, I was afraid I was going to forget things, so I just decided to start, you know, journaling. And I think maybe my daughter may have encouraged it as well. And so you can go back and look at those uh, journals, those writings, and uh, obviously on one hand, they can't make you feel very good. You know, it brings you right back to the day when it happened, but on the other hand, um, you do have these things that you can go back and you never forget them. You know, facts about that day, what you remember about that day. Correct, because after our first conversation, I went and read through some of the journals and I was like, wait, I forgot about that. And that's why I had, you know, decided to send them to you because there were things that I had forgotten. So as we already discovered in this conversation, um, you still have the truck. You still have the surfboard. Um, and I'm guessing you still have, I mean, do you still have JR's motorcycle or did you, did you sell that? I mean, no. you still have a lot of his things, don't you? It's like he's still around. I have everything, everything. I carry his wallet with me, um, his phone. I, like I said, I kept it because that way I can call and listen to his voice on his voicemail. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have everything, his shoes that he was wearing that day that were in the back seat of the truck, his, um, Shirt and socks. I have those in a Ziploc bag. I know it sounds crazy, but that way I can open up and smell them every now and then because just smelling the scent gives me some crazy sort of comfort. Now, do you have uh, like a Facebook page or anything like that set up uh, for JR where my listeners can go find out more about you and, and JR and you know follow your journey as you try to figure out uh, what happened? Well, I do have one page set up. It's it's called Help Find J.R. Mollahan, but they could just go to my Facebook page if they wanted, which is Julianne Mollahan. Okay. And it also has Julianne Kelly on there because basically, even though I do keep in contact with my friends and family on there, I use my page to journal. Like this morning I and yesterday both, I wrote a poem and posted them on there. 
and um, and I share missing person flyers as well. Great, great. And I know you're a member of the uh, Unfound Podcast discussion group. Uh, you've been there uh, pretty much from the first time we talked. I invited you to join, uh, and you're in there with uh, many other uh, former guests of Unfound and actually some future guests. Not to give anything away, but some future guests that will be on Unfound. So uh, you're going to find uh, people in there who have had the same kind of thing happen to them that has happened to you. Of course, every case is a little bit different, but you all feel the same loss, whether it's a husband or you know a father, you know, child, uh, whatever the case may be. So right, um, it's certainly a community we did not plan on joining. Yeah. But but I will tell you though, there's a lot of great support within this um community of the loved ones of the missing. Mm-hmm. And until my husband went missing, I had no inkling how many people went missing every year. It's just shocking. It's it's quite a few. You're right. The numbers are uh staggering. Uh, the number of outstanding uh, missing persons cases, I, I have listeners all over the world, but here in the United States, I mean, it's a huge country, 330 million people. Um, yes, the number is staggering. It is. It is. And if it weren't for groups like Unfound and all the other groups out there and the loved ones of the missing, now it's becoming so... Um, known to everybody, like my family and friends are now sharing flyers daily too. That's uh, I. That's what has to be done, Julie. Uh, I continue to believe that uh, the general public maybe that uh, maybe doesn't listen to my program. Of course, I'm trying to reach everybody, but uh, the general public, I'm not sure they quite understand the numbers involved. It's staggering. It, it's staggering. Um, and, uh, although in the United States, you can look at the figures that, uh, violent crimes have gone down in the United States, murders, rapes, all those things, things like, since like when I was born in 1970, missing persons cases, not so much. In fact, you could say in some large parts of the United States, the numbers have gone up directly related to drug trade. And like we've talked about in this uh, case, opioid addiction or illegal drug addiction, uh, suicide rate is way up in the United States. Those are all connected to uh, missing persons cases. So uh, I agree. It was not a group that you wanted to be a part of, and you really didn't know the numbers regarding it until you became a part of this club that nobody wants to be a part of. I mean, honestly, I thought maybe like one or two people went missing a year until my husband went missing. When I found out 80 to 90 plus thousand people, I was like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Now, it should be known that a lot of those people are found and they're found alive, but still the number of unsolved missing persons cases is still a huge number. It's a huge number, you know, going well back to when the United States first started keeping the statistics um so human I, trafficking. yes human trafficking sex trafficking yes all of that it's it all adds to that number absolutely uh any last words before we conclude this interview julie no other than to um thank you again because i, I just feel like the police and i'm not admonishing them it's just like after a few weeks of searching for my husband, it's like, okay, well, we couldn't find him now. He'll just be a missing person. And I'm like, yeah. and that's it? That's it? What? Yeah. He's just a missing person and you're not even going to look for him? Well, not unless we get some new clues. And I'm like, um, well, how are we going to get any new clues if you're not looking for him? Yeah, I can tell you that your feelings are, you're not the only person that feels that way, that Families are often stunned how quickly missing persons cases come, uh, investigations come to an end with no solutions. And there are no exactly. Answers. In fact, they told me the fact that my husband um, was a retired firefighter. They looked for him harder and longer than they do for most, and that only lasted a few weeks. So I'm like, what do they do for you know other people? Yeah. 
And it's just not that way in Virginia or North Carolina. It's here in Florida where I live, Pennsylvania where I'm originally from, California, Alaska, Texas. That's kind of just the way it is right now. Well, if there's a way, I mean, I'm trying to find other ways. I feel like the fact that my family and friends are helping share missing persons flyers, I mean, that's a tiny um, help, but mm-hmm. it's help. But I just want to find a way that we can just get it out there more and maybe find ways to have these people out there looking for our loved ones. Yes, I agree. And that's one of the reasons this program exists. And as I uh, tell all of my guests, this is just the beginning of you and me knowing each other. You've been on, of course, now you've been on the program, but we're going to know each other for a long time. I'm always going to be here to help you in any way that I can. Uh, you know, we're just the beginning. Uh, I would like to thank the beginning. This is just the beginning of our friendship. So I want to continue to help you in, in, in any way I can. And, you know, maybe maybe somewhere down the road we can, you know, figure out some things. I hope. I mean, just, you know, whether my husband's dead or alive, even if he is dead, just to be able to lay him to rest, people just don't understand how important that is for the family. Yes. The not knowing is the worst part. That's a topic that comes up almost every interview. The not knowing is the worst part. It is. It's the part that gets me the most emotional, too. Yeah. Just, and not just for me, but for all the families. When I think about all the families out there going through the same thing, it's just unfathomable to me. Yes. Uh, Julie, I, I deeply appreciate uh, the honesty uh, and answering all my questions uh, today regarding your husband's disappearance. I hope that I can help you. Uh, maybe my listeners uh, you know, will know something, can come forward. So any of them, of course, lived in that area of Virginia and North Carolina. Maybe they have some insight into something. And I appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for everything that you do. That's very kind, Julie, and you're welcome. And that was my interview with Julie Mollahan, the wife of J.R. Mollahan. I thank her for joining me and all of you on this episode. I also need to thank Fran Masucci, who put me in contact with Julie. I have to say that as soon as Julie told me she kept a diary, from the very beginning of this painful saga she has endured for two and a half years, I thought... How courageous and smart of her. Courageous because there cannot be tougher conditions in which to write anything, let alone facts and feelings about what you're experiencing. Smart because I run into this with many of my guests. They sometimes forget when things happened and how things happened at the time of the disappearance. Why? Because they're experiencing trauma, and our mind distorts time, space, and information under those conditions. And this can certainly hurt an investigation if it goes unsolved for 10 or 20 years. People who have been hurt by a disappearance can't remember exactly when this or that happened. With Julie, she has everything right in her diary. And that's why I'm adding keep a diary to my list of things a family should do if a loved one goes missing. Julie, I'm here to tell you, what you did and continue to do is going to help other families. Because some of them will now do what you've done. As for what happened to J.R., his case is very much like Tiffany Daniels' disappearance. Cars found at the beach, no one saw anything, and no signs of violence or any clues in the vehicles. But to add to that, each boils down to a simple question. Did they drive their vehicles out to the spots they were found or not? If they did, then yes, them going into the water is a possibility. But if they didn't, then foul play is almost a certainty. The issue, though, with JR's case in particular is that there doesn't appear to be a large window in which something bad could have happened. We know that due to the toll booth picture and the timestamp on it. 42 minutes from dropping Julie off to his truck appearing at the toll booth. But in that time, he had to go home, get the surfboard, and change clothes. As I said in the interview, I googled it. 37 minutes straight driving time is what Google says. 
So five minutes to get the surfboard, etc. Could foul play have happened in that time? Could something like that happen so quickly, especially to a 62-year-old guy? Maybe. However, if you think there isn't enough time, that means JR drove to North Carolina. But the police insist that only one person has never been found after a drowning. So the odds are that if JR went into the Atlantic Ocean, he should have been recovered. But he wasn't. Yep, this is a tough one. With that, we move on to my interview with Stephen Huba from the Tribune Review as we talk about this Sunday's case, the disappearance of Kathleen Kelly. I'm so happy to have back on Unfound a uh, writer reporter from Trib Total Media, TribLive.com, and the Tribune Review in Pittsburgh, Stephen Huba. Stephen, welcome back to Unfound. Hi, Ed. It's good to be here. How's your month been going? What's been going on in Pittsburgh? Um, any stories uh, that you've been covering that maybe the people should know about before we talk about the disappearance of Kathleen Kelly? Oh, um, well, the weather has been a mess. Uh, we've had a That's really, right. r- really rough spring. Right. But um, we seem to be coming out on the other end of that, and um, it's it's starting to feel more spring-like, so that's been nice. Uh, we had an interesting thing happen here in Greensburg just last week. The gentleman who was uh, the longtime fire chief for uh, the Greensburg Volunteer Fire Department passed away at the age of 96. Oh, my. And he had just retired last year. So he was still uh, an active fire chief at the age of around 95. And that made him the oldest and longest serving fire chief in Pennsylvania, possibly in the whole country. And um, the community just had an outpouring of um, kind of public grief over his death. And uh, there was a a big event at the Palace Theater, which is a really nice concert venue in downtown Greensburg. I've been there, yes. Yeah, years ago. Yeah, it's it's a lovely facility. They had a a memorial celebration, they called it, for uh, Chief Hutchinson on Sunday. And uh, much of the fire department was there, a lot of friends and family. And, um, I mean, there was a response from even the governor's office and different state legislators. Um, He was well known. And um, so I got to cover that, that memorial service, and that was really interesting. And what was his name? Um, Ed Hutchinson, but everybody called him Hutch. Called him Hutch. Yep. So he was uh, the police or the fire chief, and until he was ninety-five Correct. years old. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. I guess there's no required re- retirement age, then. I guess. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> I should know, being that I go to triblive.com every day. I did see uh, that he had died, but I didn't know that. Um, Somehow I missed that he was that old. Maybe somehow I missed that. Oh, okay. They made a they made a big deal of it, and I just got the idea. Well, he had that position for for a lot of years. So, um, wow, ninety five years old. That's impressive. That's impressive. I, I'm I'm guessing, but neither of us want to be working when we're ninety five. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. But it's not. Yeah, not. It's not in my plans. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, we'll see about mine. Well, thank you for that. Um, I, I do have. I have also noticed that there have been a couple missing persons cases that have popped up that I saw on TribLive.com as well. A couple, maybe one that caught my attention was a couple. Were they brothers, eleven and twelve years old? Do you, did you see this story? Uh, do you know anything about it? That's not. That's not something that um, I was involved in covering. I believe that was out of our uh, one of our other offices. Oh, okay. The handle that. Okay. Um, apologize for that. That's all right. I was just wondering if that been resolved. I have to uh, look into that. Um, do you think that, given that we've been doing these articles, are they giving? I know that you're kind of the. I guess you have um, no beat. You kind of pick up stories as they come up from day to day, and that's why you do all sorts of stories. Once again, from religion to uh, the death of the uh, Ed Hutchinson, et cetera. Are they going to give you a missing persons case one of these days, Steve, do you think? (laughs) 
You mean like a current? Mr. Yeah, a current one. Yeah, sure, a current one. Right, that happens. Yeah. It's it's possible, um, but like you said, I am considered general assignment. So, it, um, on any given day, there's there's a there's a whole variety of things that I might end up covering, and you know we have people who are dedicated more to like um, police and criminal courts and 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 beats like that who uh, would m more naturally handle missing person cases than I would. But it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility. Okay, good. You know, depend depending on what the staffing is like on any given day. All right, good. That's good to hear. Well, let's move on to uh, this month's case, the disappearance of Kathleen Kelly from mm -hmm. Springdale, Pennsylvania. Springdale is an area that I'm very familiar with. Uh, Leechburg High School used to play Springdale High School in a variety of sports, football, basketball, oh, yeah. baseball. I've been down there. I remember going to the movies down in Springdale when the Cheswick Quads were still there. So why uh -huh. don't you tell the listeners about you got to meet with Kathleen Kelly's uh, sister. She was an old, quite older sister, even you know, back in 1981. Judy, why don't you tell the listeners about that? Right, Judy is actually. Um... 21 years older than her sister, the one who disappeared. Mm -hmm. So it's a little unusual from that perspective. Um, and Judy now lives in Lower Burl. But at the time of the disappearance back in 1981, um, they were living in Springdale, which is a community right on the Allegheny River. And... Um, uh, Judy had her own family at the time, and her sister, Kathy Kelly, was with, was living with her mother and her brother in Springdale, a few blocks away from where Judy was living. Um, and there is a, a really popular roller skating rink not too far from where they lived. It was called the Chess Arena. I've been there, too. In Cheswick, were you? Yep, way back in the day, early 80s, yes. I've been there. It hasn't been a roller skating rink for about 20 years. And yeah. As a matter of fact, I think it's currently slated for demolition. Yeah, that's too bad. But I, yeah, I've, been, I've been there. Yep. But it's one of those really cool, historic um, roller skating rinks that um, you used to see a lot of back in the day. Right. And back in the early 80s, it was a really popular spot for not just – teenagers but preteens and mm -hmm. you know younger kids and so um Kathy w would go there and um she liked to hang out with Judy's um younger sister um or excuse me younger daughter Kim um Kim was maybe a couple years older than than Kathy and uh, Kathy was about 12 years old um when she disappeared, by the way. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, this happened around Memorial Day weekend of 1980 or 1981. And um, Kathy had gone to the uh, the roller skating rink. It was either a Friday or a Saturday night. And uh, like I said, it was a very popular destination. So she had, she she was a regular there. And at some point during the evening, she figured that uh, there wasn't enough action going on. It was, it was kind of boring for her that evening. So she ended up walking to her sister Judy's house. And um, they talked for a while, and she just said, oh, it's boring there, and there's not much going on tonight. So she decided to leave. And she and her sister Judy visited for a while, for maybe about an hour. And um, then she left, and where she, where Kathy was living uh, was maybe about six blocks from where Judy was living at the time in Springdale. So, again, when you consider that it was back in the early 1980s, um, an early summer evening, probably not even dark out yet, or maybe just twilight. Yeah. You know, it wasn't entirely unusual for young people to be out walking, maybe even by themselves, 
you know, something that you really wouldn't um, <laughs> see happening today. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's believed that she she left uh, and to to walk home alone, and um, she never arrived. So Judy was likely the last person to have seen her, and um, she didn't have any concerns until the next morning when Judy's mother called or um, asked about Kathy and Judy or Judy was surprised. She said, well, didn't she ever get home? You know, she left here last night. So then that started a whole frantic search and um, the search never went anywhere. And from what I know about this case, there really wasn't ever a, a tremendously organized search. Um, the police treated it kind of like a runaway case. As they so often do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. I don't know why they do. A 11, 12-year-old, I can understand if it was, you know, and I talked to Judy as well in the original discussion. You know, mm -hmm. she... You know, it makes no sense to me, you know, as an adult to think that an 11, 12-year-old would run away, you know, maybe 15. Yeah. It seems a little young. According to Judy, the police told her that uh, they felt like this was a runaway case and that she would return. So it doesn't look like there was a whole lot of police resources invested in any sort of organized search. And even after the fact, uh, the things that you often associate with missing child cases today, you know, in terms of uh, posters and, and milk cartons and obviously Amber Alerts weren't a thing back then. Um, those things weren't weren't deployed to to find her. So this is just one of those cases that kind of um, suffered from neglect and. Um, Kathy's been missing for a long time. Yeah, 37 years. And Coming up next month. She would probably be in her late 40s by now. And Judy is convinced that if Kathy was still around, she would have contacted the family by now. Right. Um, have any, did Judy ever let you know if any, uh, there were any suspects? Uh, did they look up any um, maybe um, sex offenders? Of course, they're easy to find online today, but not back in 1981. Judy, did she yeah. relate to you anything like that? No, there, there, there was there was a one friend of hers that she mentioned that um, maybe in her mind was po possibly a person of interest. This was a a young man who was about 14, who was a friend of Kathy's. But it, it didn't sound like there was anything there that would lead her to think that he was um, a suspect or involved in the disappearance. This is just someone who she's wondered about over the years. Um, but 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 nothing beyond that. Nothing. So it's pretty much a cold case. Just she walked out the door and that was it. Yeah, that's right. And. I I think it was a couple of years ago that um, the Springdale police obtained a DNA sample from Judy, and that has been filed with um, a national missing person organization. Right, probably NamUs. Yeah. But yeah. That's the that's the extent of what I know about any sort of efforts to to find her. Um, so it's 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 kind of been a, a neglected case, it has even been. in terms of uh, even in terms of not just not just law enforcement, but even in terms of media coverage or or public awareness. That's totally you know. true, totally true. That's what I found in my initial you know research into this case that mm -hmm. I don't know if any media you know, and this is no offense against the Trib, but. Post Gazette, any place else, and we know there's some newspapers that existed back then in Pittsburgh that don't exist now. I really don't know how much media attention this got in 1981, you know, or since right. then. Right. Or uh, since then. Right. As far as we know, there was there was um, there was hardly any, if if anything. So would you say that Judy's 
uh, impression at this time is that Kathleen was walking along and somebody picked her up. Really, the best choice in this. This point. Um. Yeah, she she wouldn't even really speculate on that. Um, okay. It's just it's really it's painful for her to think about and talk about. Yeah. Um, especially now that her mom is is long gone, and you know, this was extremely painful for her mother. Um, the the biological father was 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 already deceased at this point, and um, so her mom so much wanted to find out what happened to Kathy, um, and then she passed away. So now Judy feels like, you know this is something that she really wants some closure on. Right. And like you said, she's Judy's 21 years older than Kathy. So if Kathy, right. she would be a year old. Kathy would have been a year older than I was at the time. So I'm 47. She'd be 48. So Judy's, right. 70, Judy's like 70 years old. Judy's 73. 73. Wow. Yeah. So she's, you know, she's probably thinking the same thing. You know, she's going to pass before this case is actually solved. You don't like exactly. thinking about that, but I'm mm-hmm. sure that's going through Judy's mind. Okay. Well, Stephen, sounds um, like, I, I, please. I'm sorry, Ed. Um, please. And I do hope to talk to, uh, there are two brothers in the picture, too, who live in the area. And um, I'm hoping to talk to at least one of them uh, today. And um, he was... Uh, closer in age to Kathy than Judy was. Great. So um, I'm hoping to talk to him as well. Great. Great. I'll be interested to uh, read what he has to say when the story comes out this coming Sunday, and that would be April 29th. I'm doing that in my head. April 29th. It will be on TribLive.com and on for all of you people in western Pennsylvania uh, at uh, the print edition of the Tribune Review. Correct. This coming Sunday, April 29th. I'll be interested to read it, Steve. I appreciate uh, the work you're doing. I, I think it, uh, it's another going to be another good article. Thanks. Well, um, I really appreciate your time, Ed, and, okay. and um, your assistance. So. You're welcome. And, I, and we're, we've already talked before this uh, interview. We're already thinking about uh, May's article. Uh, so. Right. So we've, uh, I, I personally have already contacted that person. I'll be looking for the, that one as well. But this Sunday, uh, Kathleen Kelly, she disappeared in Springdale, Pennsylvania in 1981. Steve, thanks for joining me again on Unfound. Thanks for your time and your interest, Ed. Okay. Have a good day. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a five-star review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.